Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Perpetual Chess listeners. I'm excited to bring to you a rising chess YouTube star who we will introduce in a minute. But first, did want to give a shout out to our presenting chess education sponsors, Chessable.com, or we will be discussing it with our guest who's just recently uh, released his first Chessable course called Counterblow, a complete fighting repertoire for beginners. It's getting rave reviews. And as we will be discussing, the openings um, discussed in this course are kind of part of his brand. Um, so I'm super excited excited to dig into that. And Chessable, of course, has so many other new and classic courses worth checking out. And if you sign up for Chessable Pro using the link in the show description, uh, it helps to support Perpetual Chess and get you some discounts and some other goodies. Uh, but without further ado, let's introduce our guest. So as I mentioned, he is a chess YouTube star with 126,000 subscribers. Now his Chessable course is getting rave reviews. Born in Cuba, came to the U.S., a few years ago, was doing a lot of scholastic programs, something I can relate to as well. But now his chess YouTube is blowing up, and we will be digging into his origins and his chess philosophy and all of that stuff. And I'm excited to welcome to the show NM Robert Ramirez. Welcome, Robert. Thank you so much, Ben. Thank you. My pleasure to be here. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Happy to share. <laughs> Whatever the little things that I have to share. <laughs> yeah, you're, I, you have the rep of being very modest, but but you're quite. Well, I'm I'm the I'm the most modest person I know. Okay, uh, now just <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Well, well, Robert, I mean you've you've had a lot of success, which we will be digging into. But when people are out there in the OTB streets competing, I like to talk about that first and foremost because for one thing, it can be fresh in your head. For another, I think a lot of people find it relatable. Obviously, a lot of people listening. Uh, are competing when they get the chance. And I know that you are the one of the, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd go so far as to call it rare, but a lot of content creators end up not competing as much, but I know you just played and you just had a good tournament. So let's start by getting the rundown on that tournament. Well, yeah, um, actually it was a tournament that uh, I'm surprised because I'm not used to doing so well in tournaments. And part of it is because I'm not that person who started in, in got into chess and they, as a kid, and then they train and they play tournaments their entire childhood. That was not me, right? So when I started to play, I was lucky enough to do well in this first, I don't know, I want to say four or five tournaments here in the U.S. And that got me the national master title. I played like one tournament a year. And um, naturally, if you play once a year, you're out of shape. So I was uh, not doing so well, but I still kept around my national master um, rating. And then like two years ago, or a little bit more, I tell my wife, you know what? I'm doing more and more chess, content creation. Um, I'm, I'm going to play more tournaments. The moment I start, I'm, I start getting destroyed. Mm -hmm. Every tournament, um, I'm getting low on time every single game. Um, 1,800 rated players that, in my mind before, it was like, oh, you play on 1,800? That's easy. Just develop your pieces. They're going to make a mistake. It was not happening. The 1,800s were destroying me. And I got home after a few tournaments and I told my wife, I think I'm just getting old. This is it. This is the way it is. It, what else could it be? But no, I started to really train consistently for the last two years. I made a few changes in my training, my openings. And for the last three, four tournaments, I have been in the first three places of the tournament uh, among grandmasters and international masters. And I'm there like, I don't belong here, <laughs> but here I am. And then this latest tournament that you're referring to in January, I actually played six rounds. I did not lose any games. I think it's the first tournament ever that I don't lose any games. I played three days, two games per day. Every single day I did 1.5 out of two. So I ended up with 4.5 out of six. I drew a grandmaster. I put it on Twitter. I'm like, well, this is good because it was like 50 something moves and I managed to draw it. I defeated a few 2300s. So very happy with it. I'm trying not to brag too much about it because you know how it is. You have good tournaments, bad tournaments. But I dare to make a video bragging about it a little bit because it's been like three, four tournaments. So I'm thinking, well, whatever I'm doing in the last two years is working. And of course, I'm always happy to share it with those who follow me on YouTube and hopefully they can get something out of it. Yeah, well, congratulations. And I'm sure everyone listening is like, all right, well, what are you doing, Robert? Let's hear it. What are the secrets? <laughs> well, the badges. You got to add your badges. Then. <laughs> <laughs> Though, um, honestly, it comes down to, and I'm pretty sure you know, anything in life is consistency. Uh, and really, I think the most difficult part is finding 
the right thing to focus on. Because today, and I talk to people all the time, we have so much information, but we don't know what we really should focus on. Everybody is like, I'm following this guy on YouTube. I'm following this guy on Chessable. I'm reading these books. And in reality, we don't need so much. Um, a friend of mine told me once, the best thing you could do if you want to take chess seriously and try to improve is spend a month, maybe two months, whatever you think is necessary to find the material you're going to work on. Okay, this is going to be my guy or my book for end games. This is going to be my guy or my book for middle game strategy. This is for tactics. This is for openings. And this guy is going to be for me whenever I'm down, I'm going to wash in place to get ideas. Do that uh, repeatedly, consistently for an extended period of time. And that's what I'm doing. I'm just, I realized after getting destroyed in so many tournaments, what is my, my biggest weakness? Number one, I'm getting low on time a lot. So I need to work on that. Number two, I'm getting distracted. Um, it was difficult to go to a tournament where there was no noise. There's always someone who is coughing, someone who gets in as an expectator and their phone rings and you're calculating a variation five moves into it. The phone rings, you get distracted, you're low on time, a disaster. So I need to work on that. And um, <clears throat> the main thing was improving my ability to visualize and to calculate. That was this kid <laughs> who plays in this club here in Miami that I played him twice. He's like, he's a very talented kid. He's like 11 years old. And in two games, I have him by the neck. Like his dad is outside of the room with the computer following the game. And when I get out, he's like, I saw the game and you had made in 12. In 12. The computer said made, made in nine, made in eight. <laughs> and then I blew it. I was long time and I blew it. I ended up losing the game. Of course, I, act, I acted cool. I shook his hand. I'm like, good game. But inside I was like, this cannot happen again. So a few things that I did is, number one, I changed my opening for white because I was doing good with black, but not with white. And when I say doing good, I mean, I was always getting low on time and I needed to solve that. I'll tell you the opening. Uh, when I changed it, now every single game I play as white, I haven't lost, I think I lost only one game as white in the last two years. And that game was against a grandmaster. I'll tell you more about it. Um, every single game I play, as, I play as white, I'm like 20, 30 minutes ahead on the clock against FIDE Masters, International Masters. Um, for the noise that was distracting me, what I'm doing is when I train here in this room that you see me, I, lay, I leave my door open. My toddler, my daughter is playing outside. The TV is <laughs> on. So I'm trying to calculate and focus with that on. Or I put some music. I got to do it. And then the calculation, I found this book. I'm going to show it. Am I allowed to show oh, it? Oh, sure. Uh, all right. So I don't know if you can see it that well, but this book is basically nothing special. You don't need to get this book. So it's called 6,000 Problema de Ajadres. I'm sorry for the terrible Spanish. <laughs> uh, who's the author, Robert? Okay, let me see if I can see it. Okay, it's Alan, A-L-A-N, Victor, V-I-K-T-O-R. Okay. So basically it's 6,000 chess um, exercises that you have here. And you have anything from mates in one through mates in nine. Now, why did I get this book? Well, because it has mates in six, seven, eight, nine moves. So what I did was, okay, I'm going to have sessions where I'm going to sit down, set it up on my physical chessboard as close to the tournament as possible. And I'm going to try to solve those mates in eight. And even though I, I'm not proficient at finding the eight moves, if I get halfway, that's going to be pretty good. If I can calculate five moves quickly, effectively, under time pressure. That's good. And I think that's what helped me so much. I'm, if I ever get a long time, I have no trouble calculating four or five move variations. That's quick. So that made an impact. And it was not the case before. I was calculating something, four moves into it, I get distracted or I calculated it, but then I calculated another variation and I forgot what I calculated before. It was a disaster. So that helped me with it. And um, the other thing is, Finally, I picked up a, a book by Grandmaster Boris Gulko. And what he does is he shows you his games. He's a great player, um, played, has games against all of these great players like Kasparov, Karpov. And he's basically has a co-author, his student. And at some points in the game, he's like, okay, your time to calculate. You need to calculate variations. You need to find a way to create initiative. And... What I would do is, again, on my board, I'm like, whenever Google says go, I go and I calculate. I'm almost always off, just like he's doing in the book. Right. 
but I calculate it. And even if, if I'm calculating nonsense, I'm visualizing. And those were the main changes. I don't know if, if it's a little bit confusing. No, no, the, there's a lot to follow up on. First of all, uh, Gold Coast collaboration that you mentioned, Dr. Joel Sneed, uh, he's, he's been on the podcast. And yeah, those are fantastic ah, nice. books. Uh, right. I, I highly recommend them. And yeah, a lot of, lot of useful advice to follow up on. A couple of things that struck me. Number one, the story you told about distraction. I, I heard you in one of your interviews saying you're not like a big chess historian, but there's this famous story about Botvinnik that when he was training, he would have Rogozin, one of his seconds, blow smoke in his face so, so that, so that uh, he could like he withstand the pressure. So you're doing the same thing with your daughters outside, outside the oh, room. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But I also wanted I, to mention, Robert, just something I mentioned in pods before, but do you wear earplugs at these loud tournaments? Because that's something that made a big difference for me. No, I don't. I don't. Yeah. I mean, the day uh, might be coming where you can't wear earplugs anymore. Even when they're not electronic, people are going to be like, you got something whispering in your ear. You can't wear that foam earplug. But <laughs> but until that day comes, I, I vouch for them. Um, That's true. Another That's thing true. to follow up on. I'm curious about the time trouble, because obviously it sounds like you mentioned working on your openings and a superior opening understanding helped you speed up. But were there any like psychological adjustments you needed to make in order to play faster? No, 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 no. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Uh, my uh, time pre- playing on the time pressure, it hasn't improved that much. <laughs> what, imp- <Okay. laughs> what improved was my ability to not get long time. And when I do get, a, when I get into time pressure, um, I'm not the one lower. Like if I get into time pressure, I'm not going to be the one down to 20 seconds and the other guy has four minutes. I'm making sure that I'm the other guy. So on that sense, and sorry if I go a little bit away from the, from the question, something else that I'm doing is, when I'm calculating in critical moments in the middle game, I'm making, I'm trying to do a good job at saying, okay, this is a critical moment. This is the move that I, this is a move that I like good enough to maintain the position. Now, there's this other move that I like better. I think there's something here, but I'm going to give myself eight minutes, 10 minutes. So if that time is up and I, I don't see anything concrete, I go for this move that I already had prepared. It's not probably the best move. It's good enough to maintain the position. So I'm there. 10 minutes, brrr, time is up. I don't like it. I don't see anything concrete. Let me play this other minute. And you never and break then, that rule for yourself? Yeah, I do. I do okay. break it sometimes. <laughs> sometimes uh, it's a position that I really like, and I'm like, I really want to make it work. And I see that I have enough time on the clock. Let me give it another five minutes. But when I'm training, whenever I'm doing an exercise, I'm like seven minutes, eight minutes. That's my time. Now, in the tournament, I wish I could stick to seven, eight minutes. Sometimes I go to 12, 13. Fine. I give an extra five minutes. But certainly I don't go up to 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And you just can't. If you do that every single time you get to a critical moment, you're going to get low on time and low on energy. So trying to be more practical in that regard. Yeah, I, I, I talk about this a lot on the pod. So listeners have heard me ramble about this, but I recently had a sort of negative experience that you might relate to. So I'm also, I'm trying to speed up. You know, they say never, never use more than <laughs> a tenth of your time, at, you know, at the absolute most on a given move. And I've generally gotten better at it, but I recently <laughs> played a tournament game where it was clearly a critical position. So it, it was justified to take some time. I had some time, um, but so I'm thinking, 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 just trying to save this this position where it's like, I could be better, I could be worse, it could be equal, like all three are possible, but it's it's clearly a critical line. Anyway, long story short, I thought for like 26 minutes, and I've said before that, you know, there's a whole think long, think wrong so, so advice that people always give, which I've generally <laughs> found to be true. But on this one, I thought for 26 minutes, and in the 24th minute, I found the right line. Like, there so you go. that won there me the go. game. And, you know, it was on the third move. Like, I should have seen it sooner. But at some point, I finally decided to look wider, found the right line, and ended up winning. But I feel like that won me that game, but it's probably going to cost me 10 other games because now I'm going to keep tanking. Well, the trick is finding, like anything in life, is to find that balance. Yeah. That's that's the trick. That's the trick. Yeah, it, it's... it's um. It's tricky for sure. But it sure. feels good, man. Even if you lose 10 games because of that, when you win that game, it, it pays yeah. off. It makes you feel yeah. good. Yeah, I mean, it felt good just because you, <laughs> yeah, just to, to not, it, I feel like it pays for a lot of a lot of time wasted in the past. Um, Absolutely. But, but Absolutely. yeah, it's an ongoing struggle for sure. And do you know what your next tournament is, Robert? Well, I'll tell you this. I'm going to go to Charlotte now for personal reasons. And I see they have like a, a one-day rapid and blitz events so i'm gonna play there but you know it's not uh it's not classical chess but that's the only thing i have in the nice, horizon yeah. i have like i said i have a daughter my 
my wife is pregnant, which should be second one is arriving in May. So the future is uncertain. My okay. Well, congratulations. <laughs> first of all, yeah, it doesn't Thank doesn't you. get any yeah. easier with the the babies at home. That's for sure. Absolutely. But it'll be but more yeah, not, for the it'll be good for the Botvinnik gas training. You got the sleep deprivation going. You know, <laughs> you'll be ready. <laughs> Please, please don't 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 tell me about that yet. <laughs> You're right, but let me enjoy this moment here. <laughs> Excellent, and that brings me, you know, hearing you discuss your family uh, brings me to. I'm curious, Robert, about like I I heard your interviews on the Average Joe's Chess Podcast. Shout out to them. I enjoyed getting to hear a bit about your background, but a lot of listeners um might not be as familiar. So l- let's hear it, Robert. I mean, first of all, I want to go back to your beginnings in Cuba. But before we do that, I- I'd like to hear like how your YouTube channel blew up because you told a little bit about trying it during the pandemic. But but I'm curious, after those beginnings, when did you feel like you were like, this might actually be something? <laughs> okay, that's a very interesting. So the YouTube channel, it began because, you know, I life is crazy. I never thought I would be that involved with chess uh, as an adult. I thought, well, I'm, I get to college. Um, let me teach chess on the side, but just because I needed the extra income. But the moment I graduate, I'm going to have a nice job with my 401k, my <laughs> health insurance, forget about chess. But, you know, I, I kept teaching on the side and then that led to something else. It led to a business. And then the pandemic hit and um, suddenly I'm at home, I have more time. But also, I always wanted to do something for people who couldn't afford. Because I'm teaching, I turn it into a business, teaching chess. And I hire people to help me out. But it was always that thing that people would come to me, especially moms in the tournaments, like, hey, uh, can you work with my son? Yes, this is the fee. And they're like, it's too expensive. And then we couldn't work, right? So, And I learned chess for free in Cuba. Yeah. Cuba has many things that are negative, but the education was available and free. So that was always there. I mean, not that bad. I have to pay my bills. But at the, at the back of my head, I'm like, ah. So when I had the, the opportunity to be at home and have the time, I'm like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to create the YouTube channel step by step from beginner all the way up so that people who cannot pay my fee, I don't have to tell them I cannot work with you. I could tell them, look, I cannot work with you, but here's my step by step course that you could just follow for free. But also it was a little bit more egocentric than that. Than that, I wanted to, okay, maybe in 10 years, I'm not doing chess anymore. And I don't want to be like, I used to teach chess with the YouTube channel. I'm able to say, you know what? I left something behind. And that was the idea behind it. So I started it. Like I told you before we, we, we went live, I never cared about being uh, popular. Like I'm not like trying to promote it or anything like that. I just put it there step by step. If you want to watch it, fine. If not, well, but then people started to find the videos and like the videos and ask for more videos. And then at some point in the middle of the pandemic, uh, my wife and I, we had decided we're working from home. Let's go and travel. We sold everything. Oh, and we wow. just went traveling. Oh yeah. We were living the life. Uh, <laughs> and then at some point we're in Turkey and I see the YouTube channel go from 12,000 followers or subscribers to 24. It doubled. And I'm like, Oh, we hit something and this is cre- it's creating revenue as well. So this is the momentum. Like a month after, it dried. There was nothing there. <laughs> I, wasn't, you, so, I wasn't expecting that. Go on. No, no, no. no. That's the story of my life, man. <laughs> I had to do the same thing 20 times before it finally kicks in. But anyways, um, regardless, it kept, it kept me motivated. Because, man, you're doing something like you're doing your podcast. And I'm pretty sure you get compliments all the time. And people saying, hey, I, I learned this from you. And you did this impact. And I get... I don't get a lot of revenue, but I get a lot of comments right. every day from people. Even when I go to the tournaments, people walk up to me like, hey, thank you for what you're doing. There was this guy in this tournament in January that he's like, I'm from New York. Two years ago, I learned, got into chess with your videos. I moved to Florida. I'm playing this tournament for the first time. And it's so cool to see you here as well. And like that, I get people telling me, I had this mom in a tournament. She brought me like gifts because her whole family watches the oh, YouTube channel. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So that's what really kept me going. And actually, if you look at the first videos, not only do they have a horrible quality because audio is horrible and everything, but I never showed my face. On video number 100, I'm like, all right, people are really connecting. People are really curious and we're going to keep going. So I started to really show my face and then get more serious about it. That's awesome, man. It's an amazing story. Um, and, And you're still, are you still doing lessons as well as uh, your content? 
Yes, yeah, yeah. So the, you, I do the YouTube, I uh, have the, the Chessable course like you mentioned, but uh, mainly what I do Monday, Monday through Thursday is teaching private lessons. Okay. Yeah. yeah, and let's dig into the Chessable course because, um, you know, I've been aware of your content for years and I have to tell you, Robert, can you guess what I associate you with? It's nothing bad, but but what would be your guess? Like what chess thing? You associated me with... Yeah, like if I were to just... play word association, Robert Ramirez in chess is known for... No, man, I don't for know. For me, it's the, no the pierce. The, I, still, I, I, I still call it the perk. But for me, like, like, I feel like you're that guy. Like anytime you meet someone who plays the perk, the pierce, I'm going to be doing that the whole pod. <laughs> uh, well, I, I can see where that comes from. And it's a little bit, uh, I don't want to say, any, I mean, it is what it is, right? Because I keep pushing it. And the thing is, you know this better than I do. People love openings. It doesn't matter what you do. It's always the openings. Everyone, most people who come to me and they, oh, I know you from the 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 opening, the pure defense or the king's in the defense. Right. And I'm like, man, what you really need is the playlist that I have on middle game. Right. Right. That's what no one is, or the end games that are so boring. But no, 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 the opening, just the opening. And yeah, but I I, I see where you're coming yeah, from. Yeah, well, also, so, it I'm, might be because I follow uh, Omar, Omar Mills, shout out to oh, Chess Von yes, Doom. And yes, I know yes. you guys have been collabing recently. So um, yes, yes. I know he's always- Awesome person. Awesome yeah, he's great. Yeah. And, and I, I always- uh, He's always hitting you up about the per the Pierce. So, um, so like you, I'm, I'm an, 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 an excuse me, an NM. I haven't had the comeback yes. that you have had recently, though. I need to, <laughs> you know, I need to pick your brain more offline. Um, but I'm curious because I used to play the the Pierce, aka Air Perk. So um, when I was checking out your course, I was very curious because I would love to make it work. But and I've heard you talk about how people say like. You know, you don't have space. Um, isn't that an issue for for you? And you've said your results have been good. So when I got the course, obviously I was going straight to the like F3, Bishop E3 stuff um, because like to me, that was what really gave me fits. And you said it did for you for a while as well, but yes. you managed to work it out. So I, I'd love to hear sort of your big picture reflections on A, what you think might be misunderstood about the Pyrrhic and B, like how you've sort of fought through those, uh, those space uh, limitations. Absolutely, absolutely. So no, I think the reason why a lot of people don't like look, uh, and a few tournaments ago, uh, I had this friend of mine. He came from Cuba. He's a very strong international master. Who he actually he's the typical person who got into chess as a kid. He went to tournaments consistently. He's been training, very strong young international master. And he he sees me playing in the tournament. And after he talked to me for a little bit and he saw that I was cool, he's like, "Hey man, I have to tell you something." You gotta change your openings, <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's the, my point. If you are a player that you learn the traditional way, the first thing that you do is you learn the classical game, the king's pawn games, e4, e5. You learn the Italian. You learn you learn the real Lopez. These concepts of control the center, five for the initiative, develop your pieces quickly and attack. So if you do that, you you're formed with those principles, and all of a sudden you see a guy giving the center up. They're like, no, 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 this is wrong. It cannot be right. And it's too late for you to change and wrap your head around it and say, yeah, maybe he's right. So I think that's what it is. If you have that formation with the classical principles um, where you're told to develop your pieces, control the center, attack, I understand it. Now, for me, I always say uh, in chess, whatever opening you pick, it has to do with your personality. It has to connect with you. You have to like it. And for me, it's always been in life, like that hypermodern approach. Pierce defense, King's Indian defense are hypermodern openings. You basically give the center, let your opponent be happy, and then you target that, right? So that has been me in life. I'm, I'm there in Cuba. Um, you have no future there. You don't know what's going to be with you, but you're getting ready. Everyone is already controlling the center. You have no opportunities. Uh -huh. You're just waiting and doing the best you can. If you play piano, be the best at piano, because maybe one day someone might be looking for a piano guy, and you might be that. So you're looking for that opportunity for that edge. And when they give it to you, boom, you grab onto it and you make it, you make the best you can. So in chess for me, I really enjoyed this concept of I'm going to give you the center. I'm going to develop my pieces on the flanks. I like the idea of the bishop from far away. And then the moment you break that center, you create a weakness. And then I'm going to um, exploit it and I'm going to execute the plans that I know. I don't know, enough, I don't know a lot about chess. I only have my setup, pure defense. And three or four plans, that's what I say in the course on Chessable, is, is a setup with a toolbox of plans, three or four plans. 
You just got to know when to use it. So that simplicity for me has always been useful because as someone who started chess late, meaning 12, almost 13 years old, the only way for me to compete with these kids in the chess academy that had been training for seven years was to, number one, not get into these sharp lines that they already knew. It's like if you get into boxing and you're going to box someone who's been boxing for five years, you don't want to get in the middle of the ring head to head and throw punches. You, you don't have the reflexes. That was me. So you need to be from the sides, waiting for the opportunity. That's what I did. And also, it gives me that element of my opponents not being familiar with it. Everyone knew how to play against the Sicilian because it's so popular. The French, the Carocan. Pierce defense? No, I don't care about the Pierce defense. When they play it, I do my setup and then see what happens. And that's what I would get a lot. People would do what you said. Bishop e3, queen d2, castle queenside. And trust me, they got me destroyed over and over and over until I said, no more, I'm going to change it. But then I said, wait a second, I'm getting destroyed because I'm castling kingside. What if I just don't castle? And when I do, I just castle queenside. The moment I started to do that, it's like you took everything out of their plan. They didn't know what to do anymore. Wait, 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 wait. I was supposed to attack this guy on the king side, but his king is not there. What do I do? Well, I have more experience than you do in this, more experience than you do in this position. I know that now I'm going to attack you on the queen side and you have no, no plans. So that's what got me into it again. And today I just look forward to that plan. And if I've played it against grandmasters, international masters, feeder masters, and I'm always in my elements. If they beat me, if they defeat me, it's because they play better chess in the middle game and the end game. Right. But out of the opening, uh, I'm I'm happy with it. That's amazing. And uh, you, you could, if you want to keep this secret as like an active player, that's fine. But are you playing the the Pierce and the KID like every tournament game? Or are you mixing it up, trying to keep people keep people off balance? That, that's a good question. Um, one thing that was happening to me, I'm talking to this friend of mine, also from Cuba. Um, in those tournaments that I was getting destroyed, I'm like, hey man, uh, what do you think? What's going on here? And he tells me, I can tell you what a, a good reason why you're struggling, especially with the lower rated players. Again, you're playing 1,800 rated players, 1,900 rated players, and it's difficult for you to defeat them. The reason being is they look me up before the yeah. game. You know this. You go to a tournament, you're playing Ben. Let me look him up. Oh, Ben plays the Sicilian. Let me look at his games. I'm going to prepare something. So I'm playing these kids who play a line 25 moves into it, and they, they're like fresh. They're not consuming time. They're doing the right moves. And I'm like, how is it possible? Of course, they prepared them from home because they know me. You look me up online and I'm already yeah. um, there. YouTube channel. Yeah, you're, Pierce Defense. you're the Pierce King. <laughs> exactly. Not the king, but I'm the guy who plays the Pierce Defense. <laughs> so they prepare. And even though I don't get in trouble, it's like playing the computer for 25 moves, man. <laughs> you're there. And so, yes, I started to change it up a little bit. I actually put it in, on, on my YouTube channel. In the last few tournaments, I've been playing around with the Dutch defense, which is very interesting because the Dutch, you have some elements from the King's Indian defense. And the, you have the, if you play a Leningrad variation, you have the Fianchetto on the King side. But what I'm doing is always going back to my laziness. I'm not playing D4, F5 because I don't want to get into all of those crazy gambits with E4 and G4 that they're not dangerous, but you have to know them. So what I'm doing is I play D4, D6, and then I play F5. Wow. Ugly. I know it looks ugly. Well, I guess, yeah, since you don't mind if they go E4, you know. Oh, no, exactly. If they play E4, I'm playing my Pierce defense. Yeah. But you know you know better than me that unless you're playing at the top level, if someone plays D4, most likely they're not Kings Indian. I mean, Kings Pawn opening players. They play D4 and they don't switch to E4. Yeah. And that has been my experience. But if they do, I'm okay with it. But if they keep it on the Queens Pawn opening, go D6, F5, then Knight F6, G6, I get into a dodge by transposition. And many times my opponents, they don't even realize it. And I keep just playing my, my game. So that's my way to confuse my opponents. It's not that I'm playing only the Dutch, but sometimes I switch it up within those hyper-modern approaches just to keep them guessing at least. Nice. <laughs> and I understand you're working on a white course for Chessable, right? Yes, so yes. Can you, can you reveal it. that or is it too, too secret Not still? Yet. Not yet. Okay. Not, no, you know, mainly because I don't even know if they want me to say it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Excellent. Um, and Robert, I'd like to hear a bit more about your childhood in Cuba. I mean, I'm as I've mentioned many times on the pod, I'm a sucker for stories of like people, you know, coming to America or coming, you know, to the West in the Soviet days mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, using chess as a vehicle to start a new life. And... Uh, usually it's from grandmasters, you know, but you've you've 
you know, you mentioned briefly in, in one of your interviews, you grew up in what well, it was like a, a one room apartment, basically with like how many family members? Oh, no, it's not even an apartment. It was now it was an old house. Um, it used to be, you know, a normal house, but then revolution came along and everything <laughs> stuck in place there in, in time. But yeah, it was a it was a house in the countryside, and we had like a lot of people living in it, probably eight people or something like that. Uh, but it, yeah, it was like in the most brutal, poor parts of Cuba. Yeah, amazing. And um, and how old were you when you came to the U.S.? I was sixteen. Okay. Um, I came in sept- uh, September twenty two thousand and eight. Okay. Yeah, and I turned seventeen in March two thousand nine. And didn't speak English yet, right? No, 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 no. Amazing. All. And now you're actually when I when I got here, my first thought was, man, these three these three years in Cuba playing chess, I should have learned English instead of chess. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But life is crazy. Life is crazy like that. How, how did your, if you don't mind saying, how did your family get here? No, it was um, we had. I mean, my stepdad at the moment, his parents were here for many, many years. So they actually, you know, you can ask if you have family members like that that close, you can actually. Uh, do the paperwork and then they come along. Okay, so you know um, you didn't have to like ride a boat or. S- s- I have never gotten in a boat. Okay, never. <laughs> no, um, no, no. <laughs> and but I mean, it's amazing from growing up in the Cuban countryside to now you're like a YouTube presenting star. Like, what what does your extended family think of this? Well, they 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 don't care. Like, they have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> no man like look you had to understand i come from a family where no one plays chess but not only that no one probably finished ninth grade so and th- what i'm doing also my content is in english all right so they don't really so the one that is always there is of course my wife my my mom like my mom you know moms right so she's always there whatever i do even if it's something in chinese and she doesn't know just there like promoting and just very proud of that but outside of that those Cousins, cousins and, and uncles, and they, they just don't care. Oh, you're doing chess. Yeah, fine. Keep it going, keep it going. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you also said in, in one of your interviews, your wife didn't even know you played chess. For, for... Oh, no, no, not even. No, because again, I get to the U.S. in 2008. And in my mind, it's like, okay, I move, we're moving. I'm 16. We're moving to the United States. New life. I get here. Naturally, I want to play tournaments, but there's no money for, to go to tournaments. There's no car to go to tournaments. There's no nothing. So I forgot about that. And honestly, I'm in high school. So when I get to high school, I made friends right away. Oh, that's good. I met my wife. We've been together since high school. And who cares about chess? <laughs> <laughs> like we were just 17. We were living the life, having fun. So when we get to college, uh, they're doing like a chess event because they're looking for people for the chess team, right? So they're trying to do this, this tournament, see who can they recruit to represent them. What university was and this? This is Miami Day College. Okay. Yeah, and then I tell my wife there, hey, I play chess. Maybe I should join. And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that's when she found out. And then eventually I transferred to FIU, Florida International University, and they had a little club there too. So I kept playing, and that's how she found out. But uh, no one no one really knew. Again, I played chess in, in Cuba for three years, coming from a kid who would be in the neighborhood just getting into fights all day, all daddy, just playing soccer, whatever they could do. And one day I, I get to the chess academy, I didn't even know it existed. I passed by it all every day and I didn't know it even existed. I walk into it and it was my chance to get away from that neighborhood of mine that it was not dangerous, but it, and there was nothing there for me productive. Just getting dirty, my mom on top of me like, why are you so dirty? Go shower, go have dinner. And then when I go to this chess academy, the first day I got home really late because I lived far from it. And my mom is like waiting for me, like going crazy. And she's like, where are you? Where were you? And I'm like, oh, Chess Academy. The moment she heard chess, she's like, oh, that's cool. Hmm. And she didn't drive me crazy like she would do if I were doing something else. And, uh, you know, she kept pushing me. She was like, oh, chess, good. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. And it, for me, it was a good change just to get out of school at 4 p.m., go to a chess academy rather than going to my block and getting just to do nonsense with the other kids in the block. Right. So that was good. And was was there any sort of structure you mentioned again in the interview? Like the there were tons of kids there. the The teachers were were um, not well compensated for their time. So w- was there like studying going on, or was it kind of more like a free for all? No, the, he had a a good group of kids that he had been working with for for years. For me, 
All I was told was, look, you're a little bit too late to the party, basically. Mm -hmm. Go to the last table over there. And there's this book. I remember it was a book um, with mates in one, mates in two. So he gave me the page from mates in one, put it on the board and solve it. Then there's no coming to me to ask me for the answer. When I'm done with the kids teaching them, then you come to me and we go over the answers. And that's what I did. Just go over that book, mates in one, mates in two, then the forks, the pins. And I did that until I got there September, October. In March, we had this scholastic tournament or competition. So around January, February, he finally said, okay, this kid has been here for like four or five months. Um, let me actually talk to him about openings that way he can compete to see if he makes the team and go to the scholastics to represent the town and so on. But until then, he was just doing those exercises. And when he was done with the kids, I would play blitz with them. And basically what they would do is they had one table with everyone playing in the same table. And then there was another table open for people who were just coming from the street, like street players. And they'll be smoking and playing there. So for me, I learned a lot from those exercises. And then not only when I played, but watching people play in that board. I'm outside, but you know how it is. People are just messing around, criticizing everyone. Why did you do this? Why did you do that? Hmm. And when you play, they drive you crazy. You too have done. And I learned so much from that, those interactions. And that's what I did for like five months or so. Until finally he teaches me the opening. Oh, what do you like this? Pierce defense. Okay. That's what you're going to play. And I played it. I actually, I don't know if it was luck or whatever, but I actually made the team competing with these kids had been, had been training for years. I made the team to represent the town. The town, there's a story that is a little bit long. I don't want to bore you with it. But long story short, when I classify to make the team for my town to go to the scholastics, I made it to be the second board of the 13, 14 category. Because it's by, by age, right? So you have 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I think I was 13 at the moment. And I classified to be the second board of 13, 14. We had to go to this place for the competition. Imagine you got to take a bus for three hours, you get there. It was luck, I think. We got to the place um, that they were going to pick us up on a bus to get to the place. We get on the bus, the whole team, different categories, 9, 10, 7, 8, 13, 14, blah, blah, blah. We get there. Halfway, halfway on the bus, the coach goes, where is Luis Miguel? That was the guy who was going to be the first board. He didn't get on the bus. No one noticed. <laughs> and I got there. I got to play the first board and I started to win and I started to win. And the person in charge of chess in the whole state, he's like, who's this new guy? He's not here from before. He's actually doing well. And then I just got lucky. I was accepted into a school that is for athletes. I got into the chess team there. And that was me for three years. Then I came to the U.S., forgot about chess for like five years when I went to college. Then I picked up again. And that's it. Again, that's why I tell you, life is crazy. I never really thought I was going to be doing this. It's amazing. It so it how strong do you think you were when you came, at chess when you came to the U.S.? Well, I'll tell you this. I got here... Remember, three years in Cuba. Think about this. Three years in Cuba, really studying and playing a lot of blitz at the chess academy. I get to the U.S. I don't play any more chess. That's 2008. 2010, I get to the college. I go to this event, uh, scholastic event in Wisconsin. That's my first tournament in the U.S. My provisional rating, you can see if you go to the USF, is 20, 2098, right? That was like after five, six games. Next tournament I play, I make it to 22-something. Then I play again, I make it to 2308. That's all provisional. By the time I had the 25 games, I reached 2308. So I don't really know because I never played in Cuba rated. It was not that easy back then. I managed to play two national events which were rated. But you had, if I remember correctly, you needed to have nine rated games with FIDE, FIDE rated games for you to come up with a rating, with an official rating. I got those from playing nationals. You had to classify. I made it there. But then I have a middle name. <laughs> and then one event was reported to FIDE with my middle name, the other one without it. So I never had the nine rounds. So I never came out with a, with, a, with a rating. So when I got here, that's what I got. I played those tournaments. I got to 2308. My FIDE, since in the U.S., a lot of tournaments are not FIDE rated. They're USCF rated. USCF rated. My FIDE never really picked up as the USCF. So I think it got to 2175, and that was it. But my USCF got to 2308. 
Yeah. Yes. So to answer your question, I think I was I had to be around twenty two hundred because it, it cannot be from just playing a few tournaments I got there. Right. Um, and I was not really training in the U.S. They just said, "You want to be part of the team in college? We give you some money for tuition." Of course, yeah, let's do it. But I was not really training, and that's why recently when I was getting destroyed, I told my wife, "I have to be just getting old because I know more chess today than I knew." No, you back just came along at the wrong time. It's it's come up. A, I don't know. <laughs> it's come up a lot on the pod. Like it, it's just everyone. All these kids were at home during the pandemic, and they all rocketed up, and their ratings weren't really keeping up. So, I mean, it, it's commendable that you've made the adjustments to to sort of right the ship. But honestly, I think if if you had if you had been in the same situation ten years before, I think your experience would have been different. You would have done fine. Um, but yeah, anyway, it's um not important in the grand scheme. But I'm curious a bit more about like the Cuban chess scene. Like, so it sounds like you were pretty close to master strength as like a mid teenager when you came here. Um, obviously they have a rich chess legacy in Cuba. Like how, how rare was that? I mean, I know you were a late starter, as you said. Um, but were there a lot of players as strong as you around your age? And I'm also curious how well known people like Linier Dominguez and obviously Capablanca's, uh, historically were. No, you know, in my experience, um, it was not common. Not you don't have a lot of people who get into it late and they they continue. That that's that was the main thing. And that's you know, I go back to Cuba and I talk to my first coach, and he would tell me, "Hey, I didn't tell you back then, but I didn't want to work with you number one because I couldn't care less. I was, I'm paying, I'm getting paid this amount for whatever amount of kids, but also a lot of the kids that I work with." When they're five, six, seven, eight, nine, when they reach the age you had, 12, 13, they leave the academy right. because they find a girlfriend or they get into other sports or they're getting closer to high school. Whatever reason, I lose them there. So I didn't want to put time and effort into you to just lose you a few months or a year after. So that was his mentality. And that's what happens with a lot of uh, people in Cuba. Now, I know of a few uh, people who have made it. Like there's a very strong Cuban grandmaster, Julio Becerra that if I understand correctly, he started late too. He was 16, 17, and he made it to Grandmaster. I think he won the Cuban championship like two times. I mean, everyone looks up to Becerra because of what he did, right? And he started late, but it's not the norm. He's down there in Florida um, now too, right? Yeah, yeah. Actually, these tournaments that I've played recently, he's been there. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Small world. Very strong player. Yes. But it was not normal. It was not common. Um, you mentioned Lanier and Brusson when I started, these were the guys. Like I'll go to a tournament and I was always listening to people talk and everyone was talking about Lanier Dominguez, Brusson. And I had coaches that knew them from when they were kids and they would tell us stories. Oh, they would do this. They would do that. They would train like this. They would train like that. And I was just listening to, to me. They're just names. Yeah. I, I don't even know them in person. Uh, I met Brusson here in the U.S. Not long oh, ago. cool. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But to answer your question, no, not that common. People just leave because, I mean, I can't. I got lucky. I got to that competition. I classified for it. The guy who was supposed to be the first place didn't make it to the boss. Those little things, I think, kept me engaged or motivated. But a lot of friends that I remember started with me, they would just leave. Oh, no, I live too far. Or I just don't like it anymore. Or, I'm doing soccer now. Or I got my girlfriend or whatever. Or I left the country. A lot of Cuba, a lot of people in Cuba, just waiting to leave the country. Right. And uh, so, yeah, that could be it. Yeah. Well, speaking of leaving the country, you mentioned when you came to the U.S. and started high school, you managed to make friends and find a girlfriend quickly. I mean, I was glad to hear that because uh, you know you always remember <laughs> the new kids in school, you know, and obviously coming from a different country and not speaking the language, that can be uh, especially daunting. So I'm curious, Robert, was that like, did you find a Cuban emigre community at high school or were you able to just assimilate? No, no. You know, it's, it's, it's a different story with us, I guess, because in Miami you have, a, as you probably know, a lot of uh, Spanish speakers, right? And a lot of Cubans too. So when I went to high school, you have easily half of the school were kids just like me. Mm -hmm. They got here like probably three, four years ago or maybe five or maybe seven, but they were from Cuba as well. And, you know, you have that. But besides that, um, it doesn't really matter. When you come from a place like Cuba, you couldn't care less. Like, what could what could be worse than being in Cuba? And also, in Cuba, it's a different culture. Like, as a kid, um, you come out of school. Like, let's say you're, you're five years old. You come walking from school to your house. 
even if it's a mile away, you just do it. It's safe. You get home, you change clothes, get out of your uniform, get some shorts. If you have shoes, you put shoes on. If you don't, you don't. You go outside. Where are the kids? Oh, five blocks uh, away, go there, join them, just play. And you make friends and you fight if you get into an argument. And if someone tries to say things you don't like, you fight again and then you're <laughs> friends the next day. So coming into the U.S. is not difficult to make friends because I'm used to it. I'm, I'm used to talking to people. I'm used to, you know, uh, making friends. It's not that difficult. But also, to be honest, immediately they recognize you. Oh, you're from Cuba. Oh, come over here. And then you make friends and, and so on. Okay. But it was never that, that difficult. Not really that difficult. Okay. That's, that's good to hear. And Robert, let's, let's finish up with some chess Chess teaching, chess advice. Um, so <laughs> I know you've taught uh, both, like you have a background as a scholastic teacher and now teaching more adults. Um, I'd love to hear you reflect on on what you've encountered as uh, the differences between teaching um, adults and kids. Absolutely. Um, I always tell my students the working with kids and adults, the main difference is two things. Number one, kids, they do what I tell them to do. I tell them, hey, we're going to do this and this and this. They just do it. They don't know any better. Adults, they're like, yeah, but I saw this guy on YouTube who says this. I read this book about strategy and it says this. And then what they never do, the main difference, and I always give the same example. I've gotten people who are dad and kid. The dad is like, hey, can you work with my kid? Yes. I also want to learn. Fine. The kid, I work with him. And the main thing we do at the beginning is tactics, 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 tactics. Get your forks, your pins, your mates in one, mates in two. We do that, let's say, for two, three months. The dad, in the meantime, is reading books on chess history, on, on strategy, is watching videos, is listening to podcasts, and they learn a lot about chess, but they never have that um, really struggle, the drills, the doing the tactics. And then they play their kid three months, four months after, and they know more about strategy, the weak squares, and the, but they miss a fork. Yeah. They miss a checkmate in two moves. And that's the main thing. With adults, it's difficult, number one, because of that. They could do their own research, and then they end up, they end up doing things that maybe is not the best thing at the moment. But also, simply, adults are more, they're busier. We're busier than kids are. And honestly, I don't want to go against science, but you know how they say after a certain age, you don't learn at the same speed, or kids learn. I don't, I, I don't think that's true. I don't want to say it officially because I, I have no data, but in my experience, I don't think that happens. I don't think that's true. I only have noticed that, like I have a few students who are 70, 80 years old. Yeah, there, there I can tell you it's a little bit slower. But I, I work with a lot of people in their 40s or 50s. And man, like I have one, I always use him. We started in July last year. He told me, I'm 800. I want to be over 1,000 on chess.com um, blitz. I want to be 1,000 by end of the year. And right now, when he got to December, he's 1,200 in Rapid, he's 1,500 in, no, no, in Blitz, 1,200 in Rapid, he's 1,500, coming from 800. And his tactics are just doing, he's doing great. Uh, but he actually told me, hey, I'm here to, to do what you tell me to do. And then we came up with a training plan. He, he's sticking to it. Also, he has a lot of time, right? So he's managed at this point in his life to have time for whatever he wants to do. He chose to do chess. He's putting in the time. Good for There's him. no question about it. Can, um, you can look him up. He's on chess.com. He's follow, F-A-L-L-O-W, one, two, three. Okay. And what is follow, one, can, two, three? Shout out. Congrats to follow, one, two, three. You got, <laughs> yeah, let's reveal the study is, regimen. What did you tell him to do, Robin? His name is Jonathan. Well, look, of course, there's, there are a few things that we're doing. And I'll tell you even the openings. Um, number one, one thing that I started to do from some moment uh, onward is when we start working together, I, I send them a spreadsheet with like a schedule and we have a goal of 5,000 puzzles, tactics. So all he had to do was do tactics in that regard. I don't care where you get them from. It could be chess.com, lead chess. It could be from a book, from a magazine or a friend showed you an exercise that counts towards it. We got to hit 5,000. On top of that, we, when we meet, we also were meeting every week. So there I make sure that we talk about strategy and positional chess. Um, we have a basic end game foundation. And by the way, the end game foundation is nothing more than what I have on the YouTube channel. And I always tell them, look, you could pay me and we could go over here. <laughs> but if you go over it on the, the YouTube channel, it's just rook end game, pawn end game. I don't need anything else. I've never studied 
an entire um, endgame book. I don't know about Bishop versus Knight and three pawns. No, I just calculate when I get to it, if I get to it. But pawn endgames, rook endgames, you get them almost all the time. So that's already on the YouTube channel. So he was doing that. And uh, the other part that I know everyone is interested in is the openings. Well, he tried a few things. He ended up playing Pierce Defense. That's what I play. And the reason is not because I push him to. I don't like to push people to play what I play. Uh, but, you know, inevitably when they see me playing it and they see me playing it in tournaments, they're like, I want to play it. So he's playing that. As White, he started playing <laughs> the Vienna, E4, right? But the Vienna with the Fianchetto. But then I started to show him tor- uh, games that I've played in tournaments. And I'm playing a new opening as White for the last two years. And it's the Birch opening. Oh, funny. I know it's not popular. People don't like it. I play my one F4. And Ben, I mentioned before, I'm playing around with the Dodge, right? So as black. So I transpose into it. As white, if you play a four, you get in the Dodge, but with an extra move. And that's what I'm playing, right? So he sees me playing that. And he's like, I want to play it too. And he started playing it, man. And the first week I told him, look, when you change to a new opening, you got to pay the price. You're going to lose a lot of rating because you got to adjust to it. He's like, fine. He did it for a week. He went down and boom, back up. Of course, it has nothing to do with the opening, but that's what he's doing. He understands it. It's a system, easy to implement. His opponents don't know what that is. No chess book, no chessable course teaches you how to play against the birds opening. Well, there's actually they, they one coming. Don't. It's re- The timing is really funny, Robert, because uh, <laughs> two weeks before when <laughs> listeners will hear this, the Grandmaster Raven Sturt, uh, he also was, he's a big bird fan and he's got a course coming ah, nice. on Chessable. But he be- said basically the same thing. It's underrated. And he's a Grandmaster and he's saying like, I've had great success with it. You know, White isn't doing amazing like with the main lines. So like you're not losing as much by switching. And I have to tell you, um, uh, as someone playing black, I, I'm not excited for like a bird boom. I don't really want to deal with this nonsense, but, no, but I suspect, no I suspect you're right about, uh, it being underrated. Uh, no, it, look, I'm telling you, I'm playing feeder masters, international masters, grandmasters, and this guy, I look the, I played the Turkey bowl here in Florida in November last round. I have three out of four. Um, I'm fighting for the first places where there are a lot of us, including Becerra. I think we had three points. We have to win. Um, I play this natural master from Ukraine. I play F4. He spends like 12 minutes just looking at the bird. Right. Just what do I do? All of a sudden, I'm thinking, you're going to go for the Fromm's Gambit, F4, E5. I'm thinking, look, if you're thinking this long, I know you're not used to it, but fine. It doesn't take 10 minutes. You're probably going over the lines of the Fromm in your head to see if you remember them. Mm-hmm. Uh, indeed, he played E5. But man, if I played Burst Opening, I got to have that prepared. And I did. So I play it a lot online and I have more experience than you do. So let's play it. Like 50 moves into it, he was 40 minutes down on the clock. And a pawn. Lost. <laughs> and, and a pawn, right. yeah. And not only that, the position wise, he got confused, he got in trouble. I, I won the game. This is the easiest. And uh, Ian, if you're listening to this, I don't want to be bragging, but it's been the last, the easiest last round game I've had because it was like 25 minutes or, or so around 20 moves, and it's just because he got into a line that I knew very well. He doesn't know really well. And um, that's what I'm getting a lot. People who don't know what to do, kids that I play F4, they play C5 Sicilian because that's what they play, but then 50 moves into it and they have no plans. They've never played this before. And they go from being really strong if I had played the main lines of the Sicilian to just getting out of it. So that has been my experience. Now my job is to find something else because I know people are going to cash up to it and they're going to be prepared. Yeah. But uh, definitely, definitely. Okay. Any other secrets from Fallow 123's uh, regimen? Um, no, we're doing that consistently. He's playing his games and analyzing each one of them. That's that. And, you know, honestly, the main thing for him is the consistency. He's been very consistent. He's been putting in the... How many, how many hours a day do you think he's spending? You, you mentioned he's got time. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you this. We started meeting once a week. To now we meet three times oh, a wow. week. Oh, wow. Okay. So that's just me and him. Yeah. And we typically, when I meet with someone, we meet one hour per session. We're doing 90 minutes. So he, he just told me, uh, hey, I'm going to pay you this amount of money every month. And we meet three times a week. 
Um, and that's what we're doing. So we meet there, we do this, what I really think he should be doing. And then the rest is doing his tactics, he's playing. He's doing his tactic, he's playing. And he tasted the rapid games and he fell in love with it. I think, John, if you're, Jonathan, if you're listening, I think he just got to 1,200. He, 12, he hit 1,200. He didn't want to lose it. So he's oh, like, I don't okay. want to play more Blitz. Let me play rapid. Right, right. But the point is, he tried it and he's really enjoying that. And he's really, he went like, Man, I felt like playing Blitz. I felt like it's fast, 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 fast. When I play Rapid, I feel like I can relax and I can really evaluate the position and think of strategies. And he's just making brutal progress in that sense. Now, how much time? I'll tell you easily, besides what we do, he has to be doing minimum two hours on top of that. Okay, wow. Minimum. And he's always sending me screenshots. Look at what I got. And look at what I did. And look. So he's just putting in the time. It's probably what I was doing when I was in Cuba. I had the time and I was just doing mostly chess. Yeah. And he pays off. Good for him. Um, cool. Well, a couple of things as we wrap up, Robert. So any sort of big picture advice? I'm sure like people all the time send you emails like, what do I do to get better? What's your like, I'm sure you can just cut and paste your standard reply. <laughs> like, what do you tell them? No, man. I always say the same thing. Um, and I always, what I say is what worked for me. Right. And I always tell them the same thing. I'm a nobody who got into chess late. In three years, I got this strength by doing what? Um, openings, which is what everyone likes or to talk about. I just found a system that worked for me. I just know the plans, where the pieces go. That did it. And strategy, I only read one book about strategy. And all I knew was um, color complex the outpost, things like that. And then end games, all I know is, like I said, rook end games, pawn end games, and not that well. I just have a good foundation. So I always tell them, focus on the tactics is imp imperative. Everyone knows that, doing your tactics. Get a good, decent foundation in end games. Decent, you don't need to know that much. Strategy, and again, an opening that you understand really well. And then just do that for an extended period of time. Yeah. Be consistent. Consistent training. There's no way around it. People come to me, I want to do it in three months. I want to do it in five months. I want to, And we just don't know when it's going to click. I have had students that they're amazing. And if, in a few months, they make huge progress. I have others that it takes them a year. We just don't know, but you need that consistency. There's no shortcut. Chess is that difficult and make sure you enjoy it. Make it enjoyable. Yeah. Well said. And last thing, so on the content front, Robert, you've, you're working on a chessable course, your YouTube, you don't know what you're doing, but somehow it's doing great anyway. <laughs> um, what about Twitch? Like, is that a big part of uh, what you do or kind of less so? No, it's actually not, but I, I, I don't do it uh, that much. The only reason why I got into Twitch is because I had this sort of agreement with Jess.com and then I was supposed to uh, do some content on Twitch so that it goes to Jess.com, right? Um, and I started to do it. But the thing with Twitch is that if you do Twitch mainly is to play and show people, you know, play fast and make it exciting. I'm not that guy. I'm the guy that if I'm playing chess and I'm talking to you, listening to the chat, I, I lost, I lost focus. I lost the game. Yeah. I played miserably. So I'm not that kind of creator. I'm not, to me, it's more like, let me get the, the lesson organized. This is the way you have to do it. That said, I, I'm a decent player, but I'm horribly at blitz. And I was telling one of my students the other day, he's like, I'm so bad at Blitz. I'm, man, me too. I got into chess late. Those years of really building that connection, I don't, I don't have it. That's why I'm so bad at time pressure. Um, so yeah, for Twitch, I don't think I'm the right fit because I cannot multitask that much. Man, I'm going to start, and, uh, I'm gonna start yeah. stealing your lines because I started uh, tournament chess at 12 too. And I always, I also like, you know, I'm like 2100 to 2200, like chess.com <laughs> Blitz. And I always feel like I'm bad at it too. Um, but now I'm yeah. going to say it. It's because I started late. You know, that that's why. Hey, hey that's my excuse. Yeah, exactly. It, that's, it makes me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. No, man, look, I just think there's something there. There's a connection. Like, forget about the chess part. The clicking of the of the buttons on the on the mouse. I'm not I'm not that fast. I see these uh, streamers. They're like, doo, 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 moving the mouse. I cannot even do that. <laughs> forget about thinking about the moves on, on the board. So... That's my excuse. And what about your skills as a presenter? Like, do you think that comes from your time uh, teaching classrooms? Like, how how did you get so good at uh, explaining chess ideas? You know, I don't think I'm any good. I just think, I, I tell, look, I was telling the other day to Omar, we're doing this um, 
this experiment we're doing, right? And, and I was telling them the value that you get from working with me as compared to working with Magnus Carlsen is that if you ask Magnus, how did you get so good at tactics? He's going to tell you, well, it's just natural to me. I was born with it or something like that. For me, it's that they probably were born calculating three moves right. <laughs> already in their head. For me, I had to go through that process, that struggle. I remember when I went from calculating two moves to calculating four moves clearly in my head. And I had to do certain things to get there. So as someone who struggled so much, I can relate and I know how you think. Uh, it's different. And I know because I tried hiring players to help me out to teach in schools. And you don't know how many grandmasters I talked to and they just didn't know how to teach. They were great players, but they don't know how to teach. So for me, I, I guess I just came from that struggle. I know what people struggle with and what they need to listen, how they, the material needs to be presented. Um, and I, goes, I always goes back. I always go back. I knew I met this professor when I was in Cuba and he gave this example quickly. I hope the translation doesn't betray me, but he was saying how he used to work with kids. And one day he asked the kid, um, give me, mention, can you mention three different fruits? No, he, can you mention three fruits? And the kid goes, three bananas. <laughs> and then <laughs> he laughs and then he explains and the other kids explained, uh, no, no, it'll be something like banana, mango, and pineapple. And, oh, fine. Okay. And then later they get an exercise from the book and the book says, um, if you have three bananas and Mary gives you five bananas, um, how many fruits do you have? And the kid goes and says, just one. It's the same, it's the same thing. If you made fun of me because I told you, <laughs> right? And then that, that's not important. What's important what the guy said after, he's like, from that moment on, I learned to teach from the mind of the student, of the, of the kid. And that's, I guess, where I'm easy to understand for people because I'm that kid who made a silly mistake Selling, selling the same fruit, thinking it was the, the right answer, but it's not. And I had to adjust to it and find ways to work around with it. And I don't have also that skill that I just told you. Playing Blitz, that connection to think fast and find and calculate, I don't have that. So I have to find ways to play around it. Last thing about that, in this last tournament, I'm playing this really complex game. I'm winning already, end game, I'm up a piece. I make a move, and as I was making them, I was telling myself, man, double check, make sure that this rook you're going to move is defending the other rook because you have messed that up before. So that double checking, extra steps, um, I need to do it. Maybe other people just, it's automatic, but I need to do it. So I understand when my students do it too, or I even pass it down to them. Look, if you're in this situation, double check. Uh, stand up from the board, go get some water, sit back again, look at it again and calculate it. All of those things I do because that's me. If you're super talented, maybe you don't have to do it, but uh welcome to the club if you're the, if you're more like me <laughs> <laughs> all right well it's it's to the benefit of all your viewers that that you may have had i think you're overstating how much you struggled but that you may have had some struggles early on but um but robert this has been amazing um as um do do we have i know you can't reveal what the chessable course is on yet but do we have a timeline for when it might be out? yeah yeah yeah. so i think it's around may that it should be coming out i can tell you say system I wouldn't do it otherwise. It is a system that you implemented. It works against anything. That's it. Okay. Very low maintenance. That's it. If you do your middle game, your end game training, that's it. You're going to get to the middle game. You're going to play chess. Excellent. Yeah. And I can vouch. I mean, as I said, I checked out the, uh, the Pierce course and as someone who dabbled in it back in the day, I think Robert, I'm going to dig in deeper and I, cause I need surprise <laughs> weapons too. So I, it won't, Pierce is not going to be my main opening, but anyone who might play me who's made yeah, it this yeah, far yeah. Um, and that's that's a good point um quickly before we wrap up people think that they should be when they learn a new opening it needs to replace what they have and i always tell them it's more about expanding your horizons you don't want to go from sicilian to karaoke you want to be the guy who plays sicilian and also karaoke yeah and whatever more you learn just add it to the repertoire yeah especially with these kids looking you up you got you it's, Oh, gotta man. have the these kids. They they know they know the theory. They know it. Yep, they know it. All right. Well, Robert, <laughs> congrats. I love your story, man, and all your success Thank is you, well sir. deserved. So, um, uh, listeners, obviously, sub to Robert's YouTube channel if you're not already, and check out his current and forthcoming uh, chessable course. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, sir.